Good evening <clears throat> and welcome to How IRA Harms Us, an anti-racist conversation on weaponized anti-Semitism. My name is Corey Balsam and I'm the National Coordinator of Independent Jewish Voices Canada, or IJV. IJV is a national grassroots organization grounded in Jewish tradition that opposes all forms of racism and advocates for justice and peace for all in Israel-Palestine. If you're interested in becoming a member or supporter, please visit our website at igbcanada.org for more info. And of course, we always appreciate donations, which we depend on to do what we do. I'm joining you today from unceded Ganyagahaga or Mohawk territory in Montreal and, welcoming, and welcome all those joining from across Turtle Island and beyond. Great that so many of you can make it. Please note that we've enabled automated, automated uh, closed captioning for this event. So if you would like to use that feature, you just need to click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Our event today is part of IJV's No IRA campaign, which we launched three years ago this month in June, 2019. No IRA is a national effort to oppose the controversial, and as you'll hear today, quite harmful International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, working definition of anti-Semitism. IGB opposes <clears throat> the IRA definition because it deflects attention away from genuine anti-Semitism and through its illust illustrative examples, defines legitimate criticism of, of Israeli government policy as anti-Semitic. In practice, the definition has been widely used to attack supporters of Palestinian human rights, both in Canada and abroad. While the IRA definition has been adopted by the federal government, several provincial legislatures and municipalities in Ontario and Quebec it has been met by major opposition from academics, including those specializing in anti-Semitism and anti-racism and prominent civil society organizations. These include the Canadian Labour Congress, the Canadian Federation of Students, the New Israel Fund of Canada, the Jewish Faculty Network, the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association, the BC Civil, civil Liberties Association, La Ligue des Droits et Libertés, and the Can Canadian Association of University Teachers, CAUT, along with more than 45 faculty associations and academic unions in Canada alone. Alongside these organizations, IGV calls on institutions and individuals across Canada to recognize the dangers of the IRA definition of antisemitism, to reject its application, and to adopt an approach to fighting antisemitism that unites communities facing racist attack rather than pitting them against one another. For more info and resources, we invite you to visit our campaign website, no IRA. Dot CA, that's N O I H R A dot CA. Today's event will be in conversation will be in conversation format and will be followed by a 30 minute Q&A. If you have any questions, we ask that you please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and not use the chat function to ask questions. Note that bigoted comments in the chat will not be tolerated and participants will be removed as a result. Now, without further ado, it's time to introduce our moderator for this evening's event. Rima Burns McGowan is the recovering former NDP Ontario uh, member of provincial parliament for Beaches East York. Before she was asked to run for the seat, she taught diaspora studies at the University of Toronto at Mississauga. Rima was born in South Africa of a mixed Jewish Cape colored background and is a lifelong social justice advocate. She is proud of having her having held her ground in politics in the face of constant attempted silencing as a progressive Jew who fought hard against anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, and Islamophobia, as well as other forms of bigotry, and for Palestinian human rights. Rima decided not to run again in 2022 and is writing a book on how to make politics less toxic. Looking forward to that. Rima. Thank you so very much, uh, Corey. For this. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, thank you, all of you who have joined us here today. Thank you, IJV and Corey and Rowan uh, for having me here today. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by such brilliant panelists. And we're really looking forward to having this discussion. I think it's an absolutely crucial conversation. It's a brave conversation. And for some people, it's not an obvious conversation. I think that it's important because for many people, it's not clear why 
fighting the form of bigotry that they know and understand the best is not good for everybody. And I think it's really important to understand the ways in which the IRA definition actually undermines uh, the fight against anti-Semitism and the way that it hurts all of us. And I'm hoping that we end up with more clarity on these questions. Um, I would invite my panelists, my fellow panelists, to uh, open their cameras. I'm going to um, read uh, their their bios so that you have a sense of who it is who's going to be presenting for you today. And then what we're going to be doing is each of our panelists is going to be giving you um, a short sense of the essential ideas that they want you to take away uh, with you today. Um, and then once they've each had a chance to do that, we're going to have a conversation uh, among them about all of these questions for about 40 minutes. And then we're going to open for the last half hour um, for Q and A um, uh, from all of you who are watching. Uh, again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A and not in the chat so that we can, we can try to get to them in the most expeditious way possible. Um, well, I'm going to begin by introducing everybody. The, our first speaker is going to be Rowan Bidet, who is the co-author of a forthcoming IJV report documenting the repression of uh, Palestinian solidarity activism in Canada. He's a member of IJV's No IRA campaign and has researched the use of the IRA definition in Canada and around the world. He is currently IJV's interim communications and media lead, and in his free time is completing I'm not even sure what free time, but somehow he's managing to complete a master's degree in interdisciplinary humanities at the same time. Then we're going to be hearing from Jasmine Zeen, who is a professor of sociology and religion and culture at Wilfrid Laurier University. Her new book, Under Siege, Islamophobia and the 9-11 Generation, explores the impact of 9-11, the quote unquote war on terror, and domestic security discourses and policies on Canadian Muslim youth. She will also be releasing a study mapping the Canadian Islamophobia industry that documents the networks that comprise Canada's Islamophobia ecosystem. Dr. Zine has worked as a consultant with the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization on developing guidelines for educators and policymakers on combating Islamophobia, she has served as the co-chair for the Islamophobia Subcommittee uh, of the Ontario Anti-Racism Secretariat, and she was an invited speaker at the Canadian Islamo Islamophobia Summit in 2021. She's also the co-founder of the International Islamophobia Studies Research Association and an affiliated faculty member with the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project at the University of California, Berkeley. And last but certainly not least, we're going to be hearing from Dania Majid, who is the co-founder and president of the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association. She's also the co-founder and artistic director of the Toronto Palestine Film Festival. She was the lead author of the ACLA's recent report on anti-Palestinian racism. And she sits on the steering committee for the Hearing Palestine program at the University of Toronto. In addition to being a longtime advocate for the Palestinian and Arab community, Dania is also a human rights lawyer and housing advocate with the Legal Aid Clinic in Ontario. She completed her Bachelor of Science with Honours degree at the University of Toronto before completing her law degree at Osgoode Hall. Welcome everybody and thank you again so much for being here with us today. Uh, Rowan, would you like to kick us off? Sure, it'd be a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Rima, and thank you everyone for joining and looking forward to this conversation. Um, so to start speaking about uh, the report that I co-authored with Dr. Cheryl Nestle, what we were finding as the IHRA was beginning to be pushed on campuses and around the country, we started to see that there was this discourse of what would happen and people wondering what would happen once the IHRA came into effect. And one of the missing issues was that we didn't actually know the current situation prior to the IHRA on the repression of Palestine solidarity across the country. 
And so this research was very much focused towards that and towards um, towards documenting what was actually already happening prior to and with the beginning of the push of the IHRA. And so to that effect, we gathered the testimony of 77 different people, including 40 faculty members, 23 students, various activists and organizations across seven provinces and 21 Canadian universities. And research like this does exist, especially in the United States, where you'll see kind of quantitative analysis, especially some important work done by Palestine Legal. But what we were really looking to do was to go beyond this kind of numbers and statistics into real qualitative analysis using ethnographic research, which allows us to understand the Chilean effect which is taking place and to understand not just the numbers and this kind of big picture, but to really understand the impact that this has on individual scholars, activists, students, um, and especially those who are most vulnerable, people who are racialized or otherwise um, uh, liable to be targeted. And in doing so, we hope to amplify their voices and also begin to map out both the organizations and the strategies responsible for these forms of repression in Canada. And so some of our findings for, for faculty, for instance, we saw that many people had issues relating to hiring where they would be um, have essentially be grilled about their Palestine politics in terms of hiring, concerns of academic freedom or issues with publishers of academic journals and uh, book publishers, uh, widespread self-censorship among faculty, um, people who were fearful or nervous about writing about Palestine, many of whom were in more precarious academic positions part-time, but including those who were actually in full and tenured positions, we still saw that many of them were scared to talk about this. For students, we saw administration use uh, frequent bureaucratic barriers, such as um, limiting booking availabilities or putting last minute costs on bookings and things like that. Uh, we see students being, we re, uh, have testimonies of students being brought in for one-on-one -on -one meetings with administrators where they'd be warned about potential uh, issues with their future career if they continued with their Palestine-related activism. Things like this that were really meant to not directly threaten, but to paint this horror picture of what would happen if you continue to do your activism. We also saw major harassment campaigns and media, including by Jewish groups on campus, and many both professors and students reported that this made their work or their studies much more stressful or difficult to focus on because they were dealing with all these other things at the same time. More generally, we saw many people reported the use of threats of violence, either online or in person. People uh, reported that they had received death threats, threats of sexual violence. Um, there were people who had actually had violence carried out uh, against them, often in protests or um, in kind of heat of the moment situations. And we also saw frequent weaponization of both homophobia and sexism towards people who were perceived as being queer or were open with their queerness, uh, as well as many women who, who faced kind of gendered uh, attacks and insults for their activism. And of course, and unsurprisingly, we documented widespread use of Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian racism. And it was clear that for both faculty and students, those who were racialized, and especially those who were Palestinian, for, bore the brunt of the targeting and much of the most brutal targeting and most target, um, harsh. And for many Palestinians, they reported even making, even feeling that their identity was uh, a target in of itself. And like I said, and I, I want to conclude on this note, this is really much of this is taking place prior to the adoption of the IHRA. So this isn't even directly the result of the IHRA, but this is what the IHRA is coming in as one more tool to further this attack. And we see that both students and professors widely reported being fearful of what would happen once the IHRA was put into place. And the chilling effect, this kind of self-censorship that students and professors and activists reported shows that it doesn't really matter whether the IHRA is passed in a binding, very official legislative manner or whether it's passed in this much more lighter manner, such as we've seen uh, most recently in BC, that it's still nonetheless dangerous because it imposes this chilling effect, uh, effect and can still be used uh, I'll, I'll close on the note that five professors reported that the IHRA was directly referenced in student complaints to the university administrators related to their course content. And so it doesn't really matter whether it's been adopted or not by universities, it's already being used as this weapon to just throw the term anti-Semitic at professors and pro most likely students as well to silence them. Um, and I'll, I'll end there for now. Thank you so much, Rowan. Um, 
Jasmine, if you could uh, pick up the story. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone uh, for being here and joining this conversation. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I come to this discussion also as a member of ARC, which is the Academic Alliance Against Anti-Semitism, Racism, Colonialism, and Censorship in Canada. So along with wonderful colleagues and scholars, including Cheryl Nestle, Mark Ayash, Greg Bird, and Larry Haven, we all came together in 2020, concerned with the impact of the IHRA definition on academic freedom and the targeting harassment and intimidation of faculty who are engaged in scholarship and activism related to Palestine. So Rowan's um, study that he's doing with um, Dr. Cheryl Nestle is really, really important in giving us the evidence and the data and the testimonies of those who have been um, dealing with this particular kind of targeting. Many scholars working on Islamophobia, like myself, have been targeted for the political positions that we take in our academic work. So ARC developed a motion for faculty associations in the university sector outlining concerns about how specific illustrations that are part of the IHRA definition undermine academic freedom and do not allow for uh, criticism of Israel as a racist endeavor, for example. And this weaponizes the IHRA to silence anti-racist and decolonial scholarship. So the good news is, is that a result of the um, art campaign, so far 40 faculty associations and academic unions have passed motions uh, against the IHRA definition. Uh, and last year, quite significantly, the Canadian Association of UA, um, University Teachers um, voted unanimously to oppose the IHRA definition. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, CAUT is the national voice for academic staff representing 72,000 teachers, librarians, researchers, general staff, and other academic professionals at some 125 universities and colleges across the country. So that was a very important <clears throat> motion that was passed unanimously last year. Prior to that in 2020, the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations that represents um, over 30 faculty associations in the province unanimously voted against the IHRA definition. And also last year, <clears throat> excuse me, 300 delegates at Quebec's FNEEQ CSN convention unanimously adopted the ARC motion. And this organization represents 35,000 union members in 46 CEGEPs and 41 private institutions and 12 universities. Uh, and recently, the Canadian Anthropology Association passed a resolution rejecting the IRA definition. So you can see that there's been a lot of movement and momentum in the university sector. And this is very much needed given uh, the report findings that Rowan um, uh, just spoke to us about and because of uh, the fraught conditions that are faced by scholars in the university sector who are subject to McCarthyist tactics, ranging from trolling, harassment, intimidation campaigns, doxing threats, including death threats, professional attacks, <clears throat> targeting their hiring or employment, among other tactics that are used to silence, censor, and create a chilly climate on our campuses. Now, my work with the ARC um, campaign intersects with my current scholarly work, where I've just completed a four-year study and 300-page report on Canada's Islamophobia industry. This investigative report maps Islamophobia's ecosystem in Canada to demonstrate how Islamophobia is organized. So the Islamophobia industry is comprised of uh, far-right media outlets, political figures, white nationalist groups, Islamophobia influencers and ideologues, uh, pro-Israel fringe right groups, Muslim dissidents, uh, think tanks, security experts, and then the donors who fund their campaigns. These individuals, groups, and institutions comprise a network that supports and engages in activities that demonize uh, Islam and Muslims in Canada. Now, within these networks, some pro-Israel fringe right groups that identify as Jewish and Western evangelical Christian have formed strategic alliances to promote and purvey anti-Muslim animus and uh, foment Islamophobic campaigns. 
Their collaborations have been documented in several US-based research studies and in international scholarship on the Islamophobia industry. These special interest groups are allied in a shared commitment to challenge criticisms of Israel as an existential threat and as evidence of anti-Semitism. Now, and the 2002 Amnesty International investigation condemned Israel's oppression and domination of Palestinians, including discrimination, dispossession, repression of dissent, killing and injury as an apartheid system that is designed to privilege uh, uh, quote, designed to privilege Jewish Israelis at the expense of Palestinians, end quote. So diverting attention away from these human rights violations by vilifying Palestinians and Muslims through transnational propaganda campaigns has been the mission of some of the pro-Israel fringe right groups that operate within the global expanse of the Islamophobia industry. So instrumentalizing Islamophobia to these ends involves orchestrated and well-funded campaigns. For example, the US-based website Canary Mission has targeted scholars who support Palestine or BD the BDS movement or have in any way criticized the state of Israel in an attempt to silence anti-racist and decolonial scholarship. So it's sort of a McCarthyist kind of list that is um, hosted on the Canary Mission site. Now, the US-based Middle East Forum, a major donor in the Islamophobia industry, is the primary funder behind Campus Watch, whose goal is to review and critique Middle East studies in North America. Though their focus is on attacking scholars who support Palestinian rights or criticize Israel's policies and labeling them as extremists. Campus Watch also, uh, one of the organizations that is um, funded through the Middle East Forum, uh, targets uh, students as well. And in particular, Muslim student associations are labeled as fascist, uh, Islamist fronts, uh, and propagate, they propagate Islamist boogeyman conspiracy theories that they claim threaten both Israel and the left, sorry, and the West. <clears throat> and so there's a number of Islamophobic discourses that are circulated and pervade through these wider networks within the broader uh, Islamophobia ecosystem. This is what I call Islamophobia's playlist. And these uh, discourses are leveraged to demonize Muslims through tropes and conspiracy theories that claim that Muslims are a Trojan horse and a fifth column that use deception, what's known as taqiyya, uh, positioning themselves as wolves in sheep's clothing as part of a nefarious global plot to install Sharia law and take over Western societies and install a global caliphate. So that's you know, the crux of a lot of the conspiracy theories that are leveraged and cycled through these Islamophobia industry players. A new conspiracy theory popularized in France targets the left along with Muslims who they argue are colluding among each other, what they call the red-green alliance. They fear Muslims working with activists on the left to show solidarity for Palestine, thereby threatening the interests of um, the Israeli state. So these conspiratorial ideologies led to the coinage of the term Islamo-leftism. Um, <clears throat> this term uh, was reportedly first introduced by historian uh, Pierre-André Taguit in his 2002 book called The New uh, Judeophobia to refer to an alleged alliance between leftist and Islamist activists to oppose Israeli occupation and um, the Second Intifada. The term has since been claimed in around 2010 by the far right in France and has been used to associate leftist academics with violent Islamist movements through baseless accusations and orchestrated fear mongering. Some have compared the term, this moniker of Islamo-leftism to the term Judeo-Bolshevism, an anti-Semitic slur that blamed Jews for the spread of communism in the 1930s. Now, recently in 2021, France's, high, France's higher education minister, uh, Frédéric Vidal, announced on a right-wing channel, CNews, that, quote, Islamo-leftism is corrupting society in its entirety and universities are not immune end quote. Two days later, she called for an investigation into France's university research sector to identify, quote, what falls under academic research and what falls under activism and opinion, end of quote, uh, taking direct aim at academic freedom. 
So Islamo-leftism uh, is the new Islamophobic boogeyman and has been leveraged in the university sector along with IRA to police the scholarship of Muslim academics. So in closing, I want to share a cautionary tale about how engaging in the academic field of Islamophobia studies makes scholars an automatic target of what's been called the pro-Israel backlash industry. So the case I wanna share with you is that of Professor David Miller, a tenured professor of political sociology at the University of Bristol in the UK, who um, his situation was considered a test case for IRA in the UK. So there has been a lot of targeting of faculty, um, you know, across different universities in North America and Europe prior to the introduction of, of IRA um, and especially racialized scholars who are differentially affected by it. But this case was the first that came in in the UK under the auspice of IRA. So the University of Bristol adopted the IHRA in 2019, where shortly after the Secretary of State for Education warned universities in the UK that they may face funding cuts if they fail to adopt IRA. So according to a support page for Professor Miller, following a lecture he gave in 2019, where he discussed the evidence-based findings of his research about how certain anti-Muslim um, sectors of the Zionist movement promote Islamophobia through a variety of campaigns and funding, uh, the British pro-Israel campaign group, the Community Security Trust, lobbied his university to censor him. This was followed by a complaint um, by the Union of Jewish Students um, and this union also lobbied to have Professor Miller fired because of his work on the relationship between anti-Muslim Zionism and Islamophobia. Now, Professor Miller's ARA supporters have argued that the campaign against him was specifically designed to conflate criticism uh, of Israel and Zionism with hatred of Jews and to shut down teaching on Islamophobia that included the role of how specific um, groups were fomenting Islamophobic ideologies. So Professor Miller was the litmus case for the, uh, for the IRA in UK and demonstrated how special interest groups outside the university sector were involved in attacking the academic freedom of an Islamophobia studies scholar. Now, despite being cleared in the end of charges of anti-Semitism brought against him, Professor Miller was fired from his position. No doubt this case under the auspice of IRA will lead to further stifling of free speech and academic freedom through both self-censorship. And again, thinking about the vulnerable as, as well as outside influence um, that is impacting university affairs. So these McCarthyist tactics have been used against um, scholars that are, are creating fear and self-censorship as Rowan alerted us to. I have been personally, professionally, and even physically attacked as the result of my work in the field of Islamophobia studies. The harassment and racist attacks have become par for the course in doing this work. I've been very direct in my forthcoming report on the Islamophobia industry to say that fighting Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are equally important and addressing one should not reinforce the other. Unfortunately, those who oppose the work uh, Islamophobia studies scholars are doing are not offering the same concern or consideration. And since Islamophobia has reached deadly proportions in this country, it is necessary to identify and counter all of its manifestations, despite all the efforts to silence and contain these efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Jasmine. Um, and now, Dania, I'd be grateful if you would uh, talk about anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and, you know, Rowan and Jasmine, uh, your reports really do reflect what um, a lot of our report found and um, what we, we've seen in our work. Um, so I'll take you through, I'll take you through, you know, the report and how we came to it. Uh, I should note that this report um, really comes out of the Palestinian experience and we were trying to capture the, the Pal Palestinian experience in, in doing this work. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not a direct response to, um, 
like it is not the Palestinian version of IRA uh, or, you know, we're not looking for this to be um, weaponized like IRA, but it was really a way to uh, capture our work, our experiences uh, with anti-Palestinian racism um, and to empower the community and empower those who are working in, in this field to be able to, you know, to feel comfortable, acknowledged, seen, so they can, uh, you know, you know, feel feel better about um, speaking openly about Palestine. And I should mention that the report is available for download um, at uh, our website. Um, and if you are affiliated with the library, we encourage you to ask your library to carry this report because it's probably one of the very few uh, publications uh, that it, that directly addresses anti-Palestinian racism. So I just wanted to begin a little bit about how we got here and how we got this got to this report. Um, myself and my colleagues at the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association, um, you know, have been working in this field for a long time. And when I say working in the field, working on Palestine and experiencing and, you know, having our own personal experiences with anti-racism, whether it be in the legal profession, the activist on campus, um, uh, or in academia. Uh, so this is something we've been versed in for uh, a long time, but also members of the community have also come to us with their stories over the decades we've been collectively doing this work. But we, what really sparked the investigation um, was um, the U of T scandal involving Dr. Azarova. Um, as, as you know, if you're not aware um, that Dr. Azarova was applying for a job at the Faculty of Law and because of her scholarship on Palestine and her criticisms of Israel, which by all accounts were very mainstream and, and um, crit critiques and, and nothing, nothing really radical in what she, you know, she found in her writing. Uh, but that was enough to trigger uh, a sitting judge of the tax court and a, a donor to the law, law school to, to put that call in and um, dissuade the university from proceeding with the hiring. Now, unlike other scandals that um, have happened on in, with, you know, within academia, this one captured um, international attention, and there was a lot of mobilizing that happened on this on this issue. And you know, the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association got involved in that. However, we were really concerned that when we saw the you know the scandal sort of you know take ground and, and carry speed that it was becoming more and more focused on academic freedom and donor interference, which are both important uh, issues. However, we did not want the root of the issue, which was, you know, the Palestinian, you know, racism against Palestinian or anti-Palestinian sentiments to be lost in that narrative. So we kind of interjected ourselves early on, you know, right from the beginning, and started describing this as anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, we did a submission to the Canadian Judicial Council and filed a complaint and then a judicial review against the judge for his conduct. We also filed a submission with uh, Justice Cromwell, uh, our former Justice Cromwell, who was doing the investigation at the scandal. And in that we wrote about what happened from, in, from an anti-Palestinian racism lens. Uh, Issue though was um, we weren't really sure it was you know what was anti-Palestinian racism and what was being written about it and who was the authority on it and who we should be citing in our in our work. So we started doing um, so you know I started doing research because when you, you when you write to a former Supreme Court judge you should have your dots and you know your eyes dotted and your T's crossed and we did not really find much on the topic. So we came up, uh, collect, like within the Arab Lawyers Association, we came up with something and we used that. Uh, during this time, we also saw, um, you know, we saw uh, the May uprisings, the unity intifada happening in, in Palestine, a lot of activities on social media. Uh, so, you know, we were following those responses um, that was happening. And we wanted to gauge our community's interest in a, you know, were they interested in, in anti-Palestinian racism? Is this a term that would help them do their work? Is this something they wanted us to explore? So we conducted a survey um, of what we had produced for uh, the Cromwell Review to get that input from the community. And we spoke to people in Canada, in the US, in Europe, and in Palestine, uh, because we knew 
and we were watching what was happening around IRA and other um, other you know attacks against BDS uh, activists across um, Europe, the U.S., and and Canada. So we wanted to get that uh, jurisdictional feedback, and then we took that work. We got a lot of amazing responses, but it meant that we couldn't just put out a, a paragraph like we had initially intended, and it really did require a thorough report that really delved into what we were talking about when we talk about anti-Palestinian racism. So this is what we came up with um, ultimately in the report, and we decided to use a description format um, for, for many reasons, um, including the experiences from anti-Black racism, the you know, different Indigenous movements and, and around settler colonialism, and the experiences of um, advocates who were pushing back against IRA. And the, what we've come up, we call it a description, partly because we wanted to make sure whoever was the ultimate user had the flexibility to work with this text, to adapt it to their context, and that we weren't um, excluding anyone's experiences. Um, so it was, it's really a starting point for a conversation um, where people can say, you know, I'm a teacher in the Toronto District School Board. I'm going to take this definition. I'm going to tweak it to make it relevant to my context. Or I am, you know, I'm in the U.S. and you know, I'm going to tweak this as a starting point and adapt it to my context. And really, what we wanted and intended this report is to be a useful resource for those in the community who are doing uh, work around Palestine, so they have a language, they are empowered to push back when they are silenced. And the examples Rowan gave and the, the examples Jasmine, uh, Jasmine gave uh, are all things that you know people reported back to us. Um, so we really wanted to try to create something that was broad, inclusive and adaptable because we know um, this situation is gonna be evolving. It's not a stagnant situation and we do see anti-Palestinian racism manifest in very different ways according to the context. Um, and I should also note that this racism, you know, IRA isn't always employed when when Palestinians are attacked. So in Dr. Azarova's case, um, they did not directly cite IRA, uh, not at least publicly from the documents that we saw. I mean, it could have happened in conversation. Uh, so IRA isn't always engaged when anti-Palestinian racism is exhibited, but the concern being if it's adopted, it can be used. And we have heard of some troubling proposals of how IRA could be adopted into law, policy, regulation that can then be used and things that would seem benign, but then can then be turned against uh, the Palestinian community. Um, so it's something we are vigilant about um, how IRA is then used to perpetuate uh, anti-Palestinian racism. So just some of the real quick, uh, some of the key def principles that we came out of the consultations is, as I mentioned, the that we are naming anti-Palestinian racism and framing it because we it hasn't been named before. It is something that Palestinians and our allies, you know, have experienced, it's internalized, we've been traumatized by it, but we've never had a way to talk about it. And using an international law framework doesn't always address the issues we are handling or are dealing with. Um, it is a distinct form of racism. So uh, one thing we have noticed is uh, when Palestinians uh, on campuses or in other forms, uh, in other areas, raise anti-Palestinian racism, what they get instead is, oh, we're doing lots of great work on Islamophobia. Pa anti-Palestinian racism is separate from, in, uh, from Islamophobia and other forms of racism. Um, it, and again, the, as you saw from the description, like we, we see how we experience it. And particularly, be, unlike, or, you know, like particularly the uniqueness is that it is um, anti-Palestinian racism. Its intent is to silence us and to shield Israel from criticism. Um, so this is really kind of, this is really the root of, of why we have anti-Palestinian racism and as well as why we have IRA. Um, we wanted to note, and this was something that came through the survey very strong and clear, is that it not only impacts Palestinians, but it also impacts non-Palestinians who speak openly on Palestine, again, because of the shield to protect uh, criticism of Israel's uh, actions against Palestinians. 
Um, and, you know, it, it operationalized itself by trying to erase Palestinians, for, uh, you know, from public sphere or their narratives. Um, so, so we just, you know, the attempt is to silence us um, to make sure we don't appear in any type of event, whether it be on campus or in cultural spaces. And we have seen a lot, we just saw scandals that came out of Europe in the cultural space. It's not just academia, um, but it's really to erase those narratives from being discussed so people don't learn about what our experiences are like. Um, again, I mentioned this is not an exhaustive description. It's a starting point for the conversation. It is an anti-oppression tool, so we can do that anti-racism work. It is something that um, we can employ when we work with other communities around um, fighting uh, racism, build upon co-solidarities, uh, because there is overlap in, in some cases of, of where the tools or the roots of this oppression stems from. And again, it is a framework and it is not a weapon. We do not want to silence legitimate, uh, you know, we're not calling for the silencing of legitimate uh, and bona fide debates on, on the conflict. So I think I'm going to stop here. Um, uh, you can find out more about, you know, again, because Rowan covered a lot of what these harmful um, actions look like and what those impacts look like and how they manifest. So I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go any further uh, at, at this point. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so very much, uh, Dania. And thank you all three of you. I think all of the reports that you've talked about in all of your work and research lays out, um, connects the dots between some of the critical pieces that, that are often uh, ignored or purposefully um, occluded. And I think it's, you know, so often, I have heard people come back at me when I've criticized um, the use of the IHRA uh, definition, and they've said, "Well, it doesn't, it doesn't in any way, shape, or form uh, prevent um, legitimate criticism of, of of Israel." And of course, what we've been hearing today is all the ways in which that's not true. And I have, um, and we can see the way that it is silencing. Uh, people and it is silencing legitimate criticism that that is crucial if we're ever going to get to a place where we really do have um, human rights reflected across the the globe and by everybody. There are a couple of threads that I want to pull out that were buried, perhaps in in what you were talking about. Um, I. Rowan, I'd be grateful if you would talk a little bit more about the ways in which IHRA actually undermines the fight against anti-Semitism. I think that's a piece that people don't understand. And I would also be grateful, uh, Jasmine, if you would leap in and, and Daniel also, if you have um, thoughts on this, I think that many people can follow the connection between support for Israel and Islamophobia, but I think it's harder for people to understand. It's counterintuitive and hard to grasp that there are groups that are both pro-Israel and anti-Semitic. That does not make sense to people. And I wonder if you all could perhaps unpack some of these threads before we uh, go further in the conversation. I'm hoping we'll be able to have this as the conversation. So please, uh, Rowan, perhaps you can kick us off and anybody can, can leap in. Sure, I can jump in on that. That first question around the IHRA. I, I mean, on a very simple level, one of the problems with the IHRA is that it really separates. And, and you see this when you look at how it targets people and how it's been used. It overwhelmingly targets racialized people, and it creates a separation between fighting these forms of racism instead of bringing communities together. And so on a very basic level, I think that's a very fundamental issue. When you're trying to fight any form of racism, you don't want to be doing it in a way that weaponizes other forms of racism. Uh, to get more to the detailed aspect, I, I think one of the crucial things is there's a question of why do we need this definition at all? I mean, I mean as Dania said, when talking about the anti-Palestinian racism um, report, it's not a, meant to be this tool that you use as a definition and, and silence debate. 
And there's a question of why do we actually need this? And, and what we really see with the IHRA is that it serves to prevent discussions. It doesn't serve to prevent someone saying something that's anti-Semitic. Someone can go ahead and say something that's anti-Semitic, whether it's counter to a definition or not. And I would argue if someone engages in something like Holocaust denial, we hardly really need to look at the IHRA definition if we're trying to figure out if that Holocaust denial is anti-Semitic or not. I think we can all figure that one out on our own. Um, so, you know, there's this question of also what does the IHRA actually add? And we look at many of the examples of really uncontroversial Holocaust denials, the really obvious one, but there's there's a few of them. Um, and what does the IHRA actually add to the discussion on anti-Semitism that say five years ago it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been present? And that's really all the aspects about Israel. The claiming that Israel is a racist endeavor, denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination. Those are the aspects of the IHRA that are new. And that's really where you see the emphasis of the IHRA and why it's being pushed. And as a final point, in terms of just definitional technicality, the core definition of the IHRA talks about uh, anti-Semitism as a form of hate as, uh, sorry, a form of expression and really gives this vague workaround instead of just saying anti-Semitism is a form of racism and it defines it through hate, which of course leaves out things like philo-Semitism, which aren't forms of hatred, but are, if anything, kind of this reverse obsession, obsession with Jews in a positive light and really just fails to in being so vague, it fails to match and find certain aspects of anti-Semitism that are actually really crucial to take into account if we're looking to actually combat uh, the form of hatred. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that point there uh, and, and allow other people to take up. Jasmine, Dania, do you want to uh, add anything? Well, I guess I'll just point out that when it comes to talking about Islamophobia and, and actual anti-Semitism, both have a lot in common, although they have very different histories and genealogies. But in terms of contemporary manifestations and expressions, let's say particularly within far-right white nationalist groups, we have a common enemy there. And, you know, I think it's important to be able to look at how different forms of oppression are connected, um, as well as how they can reinforce each other, but to think about how to, you know, we are all divided when we have common enemies that we need to be able to challenge. Um, and so thinking about how there can be those alliances to um, address those kinds of common enemies instead of, you know, the, what I found in the Islamophobia industry work is actually the opposite, where you see some of these groups actually aligning. So you've got, you know, groups that bring, uh, for example, soldiers of Odin, you know, with JDL supporting, you know, ex-Muslim Sandra Solomon, you know, so you have these strange alliances, right, of groups that should not, you know, you would think would be ideologically opposed and yet are finding a common cause when it comes to anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia. Yeah, I don't have too much uh, to add to what uh, Jasmine and Rowan said because they really covered it uh, really well. Um, but I just one one thing that we, you know, I've been noticing around, um, you know, to either anti-Semitism education or messaging, um, especially as it pertains to, you know, talking about Palestinians, like, you know, we are starting to see um, in these trainings, the reference to the far left. So in, in, these, in these workshops, we hear about, um, you know, the far right, like anti-Semitism is perpetuated by the far left and the far right, uh, which is not something we had seen um, appear too, you know, too, uh, too far back, but, it seems to be this new, you know, this more recent occurrence about talking about the far left or and or having a focus on the far left, and partly it's because I guess you know Palestine is seen to be a cause that has been taken up taken up by the left. So, um, yeah, there I think there's like a lot of you know there's a lot of levels in terms of how of how this is being you know the alliances and and and. Uh, are being made and sort of the language being used by the far right, because we also heard Donald Trump talk about the both sides and the far left after, um, you know, white supremacist attacks. So 
this this language is being adopted here, even when we're supposed to be talking about anti, you know, sort of anti hate. Um, it, it's still coming through in in, in this uh, language. Absolutely, I, I find this talk of the far left actually quite uh, frightening um, because you, you know uh, when I hear people attacking critical race theory as something evil uh, when they completely don't understand what it means but it's come to stand in for uh, some form of, of monster, even though, as we all know, what it what it is is a way of understanding the way racism um, operates in society. And if you can't name something, you can't um, you you can't deal with it. You you can't solve it. And so it is absolutely a way of creating almost a parallel monster to the, the, the far right white supremacy um, in order to shut down critiques and criticism. And that is really at one level what all of you have been discussing. What I wanna, and, it's, and I find with the, with, the, with the rise, the increasing rise of, of the right um, and the, the taking up of this language of people who want to do the right thing and are struggling with what that means, how do we counter it? Where, where do we begin other than forums like this where we start to unpack, but how do we counter it? Um, not just in for the, for the folks who are going to sign on to something like this and, and think deeply about these questions, but how do we counter it um, in the mainstream? Anybody leap in who wants to go first? I mean, it, it mean it's a it's a very big question, and I think you know, it, instead of looking, I don't know, like it, I think it's good to start to maybe break it down um, and start start in, start locally at the very least. Um, call it out where you see it in your in your workspace or your your campus or in your faculty or wherever you happen to be. Um, I know I've had this conversation a lot with um, people who've done work on Palestine, and there is a, a fear. They they are fearful of doing this work. They're fearful about speaking about this work. Um, so I, I talk to them. I try to counsel them. I try to you know help them sort of see see like you know to, to just try to sort of get the big picture on what's happening. And I think with when it comes to anti-Palestinian racism, I mean. The fear is so deep and the chilling effect has, is so vast, we need to start chipping away at it. Um, and I think we, we start by, do, by having these types of conversations, but having them also in, in, within your networks. Um, for us, people have told us, like, and I'll give an example, um, the Toronto District School Board or the, or teach, or, you know, the Peel District School Board, you know, there are parents there, there are teacher education educators there who have seen anti-Palestinian racism play out in their spaces. And people have come, instead of having, and, and Javier and Desmond, Javier Davila and, and Desmond Cole sort of was a bit of a, a galvanizing or lightning rod, but people came together to speak up and address it. Uh, and I will have to give a shout out particularly to the racialized women and the Palestinian women who came together to speak up and fight it. And through that, they started organizing and they started building networks and, you know, and informal, you know, associations um, and doing this work collectively. I think it's very hard when you do this work alone, um, but finding, you know, f finding those like-minded coworkers or whoever in those spaces and start having the conversations and start doing the work. And in a very short amount of time, they have been able to achieve some really amazing things. Um, they are talking about anti-Palestinian racism when no one imagined maybe a year or two ago that you would be able to. Um, they are building co-solidarities with other groups who are also working on, on anti-racism. Um, and they're building on the teachings from, you know, anti-Black racism, from, the, again, the indig you know, 
indigenous groups who are fighting settler colonialism. They are learning from those successes, building upon those successes. Um, but I think we have to work, and this is what I hope this report will do, is help lift the fear, lift the chilling effect, um, so people feel more comfortable to do this work. Um, because for, you know, sometimes the, we, the fear is more in our head and we're, we're you know, I'm not saying that there isn't those challenges, but, uh, but you know, we stop ourselves from doing that work and it also has an impact when, and this is what our report found is that, and I, my personal experience, being silent, not self-identifying, identifying, hiding your identity, keeping quiet when you, when these things happen does also take a personal toll as well. Um, so yeah, like just, you know, I say, you know, at one point, I mean, we can talk about the politic, political piece late, at some point, but get comfortable and, and find those networks, people that you can do this work together with. Thanks so much. Jasmine, any, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I echo so much of what, what Danya said, you know, this is a really formidable uh, challenge. I really talk about, you know, fighting Islamophobia, for example, in all of its manifestations. And a lot of this is so tied into that as a kind of game of whack-a-mole, right? Something pops up, you get that, and then something else is coming up, right? So there's always new iterations of, um, you know, of, uh, of these different kinds of oppressions that are coming up and new ways of packaging things, you know, old wine and new skins type of thing. And so you always have to be pivoting and attentive to the various ways that they're going to creep up and in what sector and in what way. So, um, you know, that it takes a lot to stay on top of. And we can't do that alone. There have to be those alliances and solidarities. And so when I, you know, started my, um, talk, I mentioned the work that I did with the ARC Collective, which, you know, was a group that came together in a very sort of ad hoc um, fashion, but, you know, involved Palestinians and, and um, you know, members of IJV, also myself and my other colleague who are not um, Jewish or Palestinian, but uh, you know, come to it from, uh, you know, from a position of allyship and also from our own uh, implication in doing Palestinian solidarity work. So, you know, that was, for me, a really important um, association to be involved with, to take on this, uh, you know, this campaign, uh, coming out of a great deal of targeting myself. And it felt um, like, empowering in a way to be able to um, engage in something active to challenge this and not simply just be you know cursing and in you know privately and uh you know ranting to other people but to translate um what we know and what we know needs to be done into something you know concrete and i think that can be done on many levels you know through education through lobbying um through creating counter narratives, through promoting, you know, the arts and cultural production. So it's wonderful the work Danya does with the, the film festival. You know, I think there's so much particularly that youth bring to the table as well in terms of, you know, um, creating uh, counter public spaces to have conversations and, and dialogues. And sometimes those, you know, um, interests that are so diametrically opposed can come together. In my book on um, the 9-11 generation, I looked at artists and their role and creating sort of anti-colonial public pedagogy. And there was a case study of a Palestinian and Israeli comedy troupe that came together in the UK specifically to challenge some of these issues. And they did it through comedy to try and break down people's barriers. And then they had facilitated dialogue among the audience because again, it is a game of whack-a-mole and we have to learn to pivot and we have to find new and creative ways to address, um, you know, all the multiple facets of this threat. So I think it's like a, you know, we have to act on, on multiple fronts. And I'm very grateful for the definition of anti-Palestinian racism so that we can all use it, reference it, cite it, um, leverage it. And that gives us, you know, uh, you know, that distinct uh, formation of anti-Palestinian racism to bring into the conversation around other kinds of intersectional um, racisms and uh, that we need to start using because otherwise, you know, it is something that can easily, without being able to name it, it can be easily uh, discredited or, uh, you know, under the rug, which is what's been happening. So I, I think there are some positive um, uh, you know, uh, things on the horizon that we can build on. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I remember when the word Islamophobia was so controversial, it was difficult to get folks to use it. Um, and there was uh, a whole big fuss about that term, whether it was a legitimate term, when uh, the motion M103 was introduced in Parliament after the Quebec uh, mosque shooting. So having the these terms be in common parlance, being able to use them is an absolutely crucial tool in moving forward. I couldn't agree more. Rowan, did you want to add your sense of, of how we can move these conversations forward? Uh, certainly, I can try and add on, although it's, it's difficult because Daniel and Jasmine covered so much. But I, I totally agree that the kind of putting forward these new terms is super important. And, and one thing that I've maybe found in, in engaging with people who are, who are younger and students is that so often I feel like people are already there, even people who perhaps don't have, say, IJV's position on Israel-Palestine, whether they're Jewish or not, still recognize that there's something wrong with the way that anti-Semitism is being used. And I think that that really highlights an aspect of the IHRA, which is a kind of desperation of these groups in tying the defense of Israel to anti-Semitism and really sacrificing the safety of diasporic Jews in the process. And, you know, diasporic Jews, Israeli Jews, uh, non-Jews who I speak to can kind of, you know, they recognize this. And so I think Danya's point about bringing these conversations and this information to community spaces, to conversations uh, among people who aren't um, you know, necessarily doing the academic work that backs this up is extremely important. And I, I think that there's receptivity to it. And I think that this is a space that there is uh, a lot of work that we would be welcome in doing that we are welcome in doing. And I think um, one of the forms that we, we see in from IJV's perspective is that very much one of the best things we can do is to just kind of move forward with the fight against anti-Semitism and just, you know, we obviously put a lot of effort into fighting the IHRA, but at the same time, just say, okay, well, this is going to happen and this is going on. But at the same time, we have to stay focused and fight real anti-Semitism and, and bring information on real anti-Semitism. And so we're doing things like workshops um, with anti-racist perspectives on anti-Semitism, et cetera, and similar work that kind of just focuses on Islamophobia and, and those kinds of trainings is, is needed as well. And so I think that there is a certain way in which, um, you know, it's it's easy to get caught up in fighting things like the IHRA and actually lose sight of the, the core issues. And it's important to keep an eye on both fronts uh, while we're doing this work. Uh, and so that's something that we've been when trying to do. And uh, I no IHRA campaign just grew so fast that we weren't really keeping up. And, and I think over the last year, we've been doing a lot more work um, to really combat directly real anti-Semitism. And, and that's something that we're planning on continuing. Thanks so very much. I certainly noticed in my time uh, at Queen's Park that um, it, 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 this was, it was a real issue that, that folks who were focused on um, getting IHRA uh, to be accepted uh, we're often not doing the work of fighting actual anti-Semitism. And I found myself so often in a very odd position where I'd be trying to say, no, not don't go the IHRA direction. It's really problematic. But why is nobody paying attention to this actual anti-Semitism that's happening um, over here? Same time, I, I want to mention that I think it's what we're doing here today is so crucial. Um, having Jews, Muslims, Palestinians, Arabs uh, come together um, to discuss these issues and recognize the importance of fighting anti-Semitism, of fighting Islamophobia, and of fighting anti-Palestinian racism, all of those three things together, in addition to, of course, anti-Black racism and other forms of bigotry, is absolutely crucial. One question that I have uh, for you, Danya, is have you noticed um, beyond the campaigns you were specifically talking about, have you noticed um, the term anti-Palestinian racism starting to come into use? Uh, is there something that folks watching this can help uh, to, to move on? Because I think it is absolutely crucial. 
I think lots of people out there, it never occurred to them that there was such a thing once they understand it in the same way that once they understood people began to grasp what Islamophobia is, then you start to see it, then you can start to react to it. Um, but but how, how much is it getting uh, picked up? Yeah, I mean, the, the report has gained a lot of traction. So we're seeing it being used, um, you know, globally uh, in Europe. Uh, it's, it's, you know, got a lot of pickup in Europe and in the US in addition to Canada. Um, we recently saw it being included in the Peel District School Board's um, new anti-racism policy. So they've added anti-Palestinian racism amongst the other forms of racism that they will be tackling, which um, again, that is because of uh, organizing from that community uh, and them sharing their stories. We have seen the term because of uh, our work, um, you know, the judicial review we did um, uh, regarding the conduct of Justice Spiro, we saw the Globe and Mail uh, writing about anti-Palestinian racism in their story uh, in reference to our complaint. Um, we saw um, an op-ed uh, in the Toronto Star that uh, pushed back that um, IRA was a form of anti-Palestinian racism. So, uh, and we saw another article uh, in the National Post that also uh, featured uh, pushback that, you know, um, IRA was not anti-Palestinian racism. So we are, we're seeing it both from the offensive and the defensive, where we're seeing community groups, um, community groups uh, organizing around anti-Palestinian racism um, and calling things out as anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, organizing happening in Germany, uh, and they were using that term to talk about what was happening to silence uh, and stop the Nakba protest and the Shireen, the protests around the killing of Shireen Abu Akle, and then uh, the attacks on the Palestinian artists at Documenta 15. They were tagging us and saying this is anti-Palestinian racism and sharing the definition. Uh, but we're, then we're also seeing, you know, uh, very, you know, very recently we've been seeing those um, who are known for their attacks on Palestinians, you know, coming out to say, I am not, anti you know, I am not an anti-Palestinian, you know, anti-Palestinian racism. Um, this is not anti-Palestinian racism. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that they've kind of adopted the language as well, uh, much quicker than I thought they would. Um, so we, we are we are seeing the uptake and, and I think as the more people use the term, the more people cite the report or other other writings, because there are a lot of academic articles now coming out on anti-Palestinian racism. The more people use that as a term, I think it will be, uh, get rapid pickup because the work has already been, a lot of the anti-racism work has been done by the black community and the indigenous community. And a lot of that, and, and around Islamophobia, like, you know, it was such a hard push for those communities um, to get, uh, you know, this language and understanding and lens brought forward. So we, I feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're following in that path, which is, is, you know, and we're learning from that path. But again, we have to be prepared for the, the pushback that those communities also experience. You know, uh, we, we are prepared for, for potential pushback uh, over the use of anti-Palestinian racism as well. Thank you so much. Jasmine, I wonder if you could pick up on what Dani has been uh, saying and really talk as somebody who has watched the fight over the term Islamophobia unfold. Um, how did you see the adoption of the term help to focus on the phenomenon and help in, in, in if you will, in the fight that we're, we're all engaged in here today? Thank you for that question, Rima. I think, you know, the term Islamophobia is one that's been, you know, highly contested in different um, circles. First of all, the argument that, you know, it doesn't allow criticism, uh, you know, legitimate criticism of Islam, these kinds of uh, arguments, right down to, you mentioned the backlash against Motion 103, uh, which was tabled by uh, Liberal MP uh, Ikra Khalid out in the aftermath of the Quebec mosque shooting. That was really one of the flashpoints in the Islamophobia industry, which galvanized all sectors to try and condemn that 
um, motion, uh, using the argument that Islamophobia didn't have a clear definition, uh, you know, and therefore could be open to interpretation, um, you know, and so, uh, I mean, even uh, I recall that the Toronto District School Board had in their sort of anti-Islamophobia guide, a definition of Islamophobia that um, was contested. And I know B'nai B'rith contacted them and within hours they changed that definition. Um, and it's very interesting to me, you know, the kinds of arguments that are leveraged against Motion 103 and its adoption of Islamophobia as something that, you know, uh, should be studied and, and challenged and so on. Um, you know, was this idea that it was the, all the fear mongering, this is going to bring in blasphemy laws, this is going to usher in Sharia, creeping Sharia. So all of this kind of, you know, uh, moral panic and hysteria has been created around this definition. Um, and, you know, I would say that there are, you know, I have a way that I use the definition of Islamophobia that I've created in the work that I do. Um, and there are other scholars who may have a slightly different variation of it, according to whether they're working in law, for example, where they need to apply it in a different way than I would as a sociologist. So there is some fluidity to the terminology, um, which has been used against it as, well, there's no clear definition. I remember when I was testifying at the hearings on Motion 103 in Parliament, and they brought up the fact, well, you know, what is it, what's definition? I said, you know, if I was to ask all of you sitting here to give me a definition of racism, I, I'm pretty sure you'd all give me different definitions and none of them would be the one that I have as a race scholar. So why is it that, you know, uh, Islamophobia is being held to a, you know, different standard? So how, you know, the definition itself has been weaponized and being used to undermine any work under the banner of Islamophobia has been very challenging. There's also a split between now people who prefer the term anti-Muslim racism as opposed to Islamophobia. Um, from where I sit, I see Islamophobia, uh, anti-Muslim racism as a manifestation of um, Islamophobia. It's, you know, religion is definitely racialized here. Um, and it's a manifestation of how Islamophobia affects uh, you know, Muslims. Um, but you, you kind of can't ha take the Islam out of it in the sense that so much of what I see in terms of the discourses about Islamophobia very much have to do with things like weaponizing the Quran, taking it out of context, or really taking issue, um, you know, with this idea that there is this, you know, global campaign to install an Islamic caliphate, all these kinds of things are very much rooted uh, you know, in a, in this, the fear of, of Muslim traditions and of Islam. And, you know, that is what makes Muslims relevant to this question is the fact that there's an adherence to Islam or anyone perceived to be Muslim. You don't even have to be Muslim to be a victim of Islamophobia because there have been Sikhs and others who have been uh, misrecognized uh, as Muslims and have, su have been, you know, suffered violence. The first person killed in reprisal for the 9-11 attacks was a Sikh man. Uh, because he was wearing a turban, right? So, um, you know, so the, the definitional wars here, I think, are, are interesting, um, but can be distracting. And I think that, you know, it's important to how we operationalize these definitions, how we use them to help us identify a phenomenon, helps us then understand how we need to intervene in it. So they cannot be narrow. Uh, they need to, you know, for example, my definition looks at Islamophobia as a system of oppression that has individual ideological and systemic manifestations, because we need to address it at all those levels. We can't just look at one without looking at the other and how they are all connected. So that holistic, um, I think, uh, definition for me is important in the work that I do. Thanks so much, uh, Jasmine. So one of the questions that has been posed in the chat while we're talking about these definitions is um, whether, given everything uh, that you were talking about earlier, Rowan, the IHRA definition itself can be seen as anti-Semitic in the way that it doesn't actually help us to fight uh, actual anti-Semitism. And uh, the questioner asks, um, whether this is a reasonable assessment, and if so, can this messaging be useful to encourage a closer look and better vetting uh, of those pushing for the adoption of IHRA? 
Um, maybe I'll start with you, Rowan, and then if either Jasmine or Danya would like to, to chime in, that would be great. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a certainly an interesting um, perspective. I'm, I'm not sure that the IHRA could be considered explicitly anti-Semitic. I think it could, and I would argue should, be understood as failing to under, properly understand what anti-Semitism is, as I, as I previously explained. Um, I, I think to, to flip it totally and argue that it is thus anti-Semitic risks getting into those kinds of back and forths, um, kind of definitional wars that Jasmine mentioned where just a lot of terminology getting thrown around. And it's it's quite important to perhaps be a bit more specific and say that it it fails in addressing anti-Semitism, it fails in understanding anti-Semitism, and it frankly bastardizes what anti-Semitism is to suit a political purpose. Um, and I think that those are all quite specific in, uh, statements um, rather than making perhaps a more general claim. Uh, so I would say to claim that the IHRA harms the fight against anti-Semitism is certainly uh, accurate. And I think that an argument could be made that in arguing that, or in saying that describing Israel as a racist endeavor as anti-Semitic is erasure and perhaps then thus anti-Palestinian racism because of the racist Palestinian experience, which much of which is mired by Israel's racist colonial project. Um, but to say that it's anti-Semitic because it fails to address anti-Semitism properly, I'm not totally convinced personally. Jasmine, Danya, do you want to, to chime in? I mean, I think, uh, I th yeah, I, I agree with Rowan's answer 100%. So, you know, I, um, you know, I don't have anything to add on that point, but, you know, one of the, one of the challenges with, with the, with the IRA definition is that in many ways, especially through the examples, it perpetuates the tropes that many of us are accused of, um, of, you know, projecting uh, when we do our advocacy work. So uh, many, many Palestinians, uh, you know, and this, okay, I'll, I'll speak to ourselves. We were accused when we, when we filed our materials to the court for the judicial review, um, the intervener in the case uh, accused us of, uh, um, accused us of, of our, and our materials of being anti-Semitic, that our complaint was founded in anti-Semitism and that we were perpetuating the dual loyalty trope against um, Justice Spiro. Um, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, the court did not accept that, um, that our materials were anti-Semitic. So that was at least, you know, one small win that we got that, you know, none of the parties were, were anti-Semitic, but the examples really do conflate um, the Jews with Israel, um, which is anti-Semitic as, you know, uh, you know, but then when, but then it makes it very hard for us to then talk about it without then being accused of being anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic. And there is, it's very difficult for us to, to talk about Israel um, without kind of having that dual loyalty, you know, or being accused of dual, dual loyalty, but we're not the ones who conflated the two. Um, so when we ch we challenge the state of Israel, we are accused of erasing Jewish identity or attacking Jewish um, Jewish identity, um, and but at the, you know because they are conflated. But then we are then also at the same time accused of making arguments around dual loyalty when we're trying to parse it out. So it becomes this very weird circular um, loop you end up when you're trying to critique anything. And I think that's the point. We there's just no way. So you will have those saying oh no no you're you're being paranoid um or you're being irrational like anti criticism of israel isn't anti-semitic under ira but then there's just no i haven't figured out a way how you can critique it without then being caught up in some way because it's just so like jews and israel are so conflated holocaust and israel are being conflated and you know that's a concern that um we're watching out for um but so there's just no way to have a conversation or critique Israel without being accused of denying the Holocaust or undermining the Holocaust or, um, you know, uh, perpetuating a dual loyalty uh, trope. So 
yeah, it, it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's a challenge. And then what happens, no one talks about anti-Semitism and no one talks about um, anti-Palestinian racism or, or Palestine or, uh, because everyone's too afraid to talk uh, and that benefits neither community. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Jasmine, your thoughts? Uh, I really, I think uh, Rowan and, and Danya have covered everything, so I don't have a lot to add. And, you know, to be honest, as someone who is not Jewish, I would not weigh in on a definition of anti-Semitism. It is not my place to do that. The only reason that, you know, I'm involved in, you know, the campaign around IRA is really because of the way the illustration, particularly around, uh, you know, not being able to criticize Israel as a racist endeavor and how that impacts uh, and silences legitimate critique in the kind of work that I do and many others do, uh, both in terms of activism as well as in terms of academic work. And that is the only reason. Otherwise, I don't feel it's my place at all as someone who is not Jewish to, um, to weigh in on a definition uh, around anti-Semitism. So, you know, it, it, you know, I'm coming at it from that um, angle. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Rowan and, and Danya covered it beautifully. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time yet. Uh, one thing, I, I, I guess one, one final thing that perhaps you could, you could all um, weigh in on is it, it feels to me that we are really at this moment in time in a, in a, in a growing and pitted battle against um, white supremacy, uh, both in the sense of these far right groups uh, that are gaining strength and power. Um, and then also in sort of the, the default idea that, uh, that uh, whiteness is the default normal, uh, white Christianity is the default normal, that anything that challenges that is somehow, um, or seeks to correct that is somehow deeply problematic. And it feels to me that one of the reasons it's important that we all come together is because white supremacy benefits when we are divided and fighting against each other. And I wonder if um, you have any uh, concluding thoughts on how we can effectively push back at those, at that, those very real problems. Uh, it, it is, uh, it feels to me a kind of life and death battle that we're all engaged in here um, to both get these, uh, get these ideas clear, uh, to stop conflating these issues and yet to be able to work together against um, the bigger uh, enemy, if you will. Um, so I, I would love all of your thoughts and uh, whoever wants to go first, please go ahead. Uh, well, I can jump in and, you know, the, this, um, everything you said, Rima, I totally agree with. And it was sort of the point I was making earlier around how, you know, these forms of oppression are connected and we need to be able to work in concert to try and deal with the common enemy that we have. And that is uh, white nationalism, white nationalist groups in this country. There's around 300. Um, in our report, we looked at about 30 that are specifically, you know, sort of Islamophobic in their mandate and rhetoric. Um, and, you know, those same groups are also going to be anti-Semitic too, right? So there's, there's that uh, common uh, sort of enemy that we have to deal with in terms of white nationalism and the movements that are, uh, you know, uh, galvanizing around uh, that. But there's also ways that I found that uh, white nationalism gets kind of camouflaged or what I call liberal washed through different kinds of terminology. Uh, using terms like um, Judeo-Christian values, um, the rule of law, you know, democracy, and leveraging those terms in specific ways, uh, you know, to sort of say, well, you know, these people are not, um, they're anti-democratic. 
technocratic, they're pre-modern, they, you know, they reproducing sort of idioms of colonial racism using terms like barbaric and so on, right, to um, are another way that, you know, using a lot of the liberal rhetoric, it kind of gets uh, what, you know, um, liberal washed, as I say, and it camouflages white nationalism, right, in that way. So we have to be uh, attentive to the proxies, the language that's used, that's coded. Um, that is still gesturing to, you know, the supremacy, white supremacy, and, um, you know, helps to kind of provide a political cover for the groups that are promoting those ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for, uh, for reminding us of that. It's really important. Danya, would you like to? Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with uh, Jasmine. Um, and I think, you know, what we have to realize is that, um, you know, this pushback, it's not just, we're not just seeing it happen around our communities, it's, it's also other communities. And this is something we've seen in the law society, um, elsewhere, where there is a pushback against critical race theory, you know, against challenging settler colonialism. And, and I would probably say even more, more so than, um, or it's much more intense. Um, we saw critical race theory blamed for mass shootings. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, and so on. It, it, um, and this is, I think the response, you know, uh, this is sort of the, the backlash we, we are seeing from, uh, white supremacists. Um, and I agree with Jasmine as well that it's, there's two, the overt stuff is easy. We see it, it's, it's um, out there, um, it's easy to identify, but it's the systems of oppression, you know, and with the maintenance of the systems of oppression, which is harder to tackle because it's, you know, not easy to see. And, you know, one thing I wanted to maybe point out to, you know, again, is this work, um, you know, to tackle the system of, of, of oppression means doing the hard anti-racism work. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. It, it actually, the power is in the discomfort that we cause when we raise these issues. So we should embrace that discomfort because that's where our power lies. Um, and that's why you then see the pushback because people don't like being uncomfortable or being made uncomfortable. What we see in academia, although changing, but you know, in other professional in institutions, um, is that work is being supplanted by diversity, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion work. That work is not anti-racism work, not in my, not in my opinion, and not other people's opinion. But we have seen it being used as a way to protect the systems of oppression, but let you know, those excluded um, groups or histor historically marginalized group sort of feel like get a buy-in to the maintenance of the systems of oppression. Um, so this is something we need to, you know, and we talk about this in the report because when people go to their departments or their, their offices of EDI, many of those EDI offices were perpetuators of anti-Palestinian racism or, you know, inviting guests um, and, you know, upholders of the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism, um, they, did, they didn't understand the work. They're not interested in, in, in tackling racism. They were there to kind of create the comfort between those wanting to push back against the systems, uh, against racism, and those who want to maintain the, um, you know, and who are benefiting, because at the end of the day, people want to uphold these systems of oppression because they're benefiting from them. So I think co-solidarities is important. Um, again, you know, we need to, you know, there's others who've been in the fight longer than us or who've, you know, been in the trenches, um, know, know what to, you know, have those experiences, have those lessons. So, and I think we're in many cases, we are aligned in that work. So I think co-solidarities are really important into pushing back against the diverse, the limitations of diversity initiatives, not falling into it. Um, because yeah, I, because again, when we talk about anti-racism work, we're really talking about dismantling those systems that keep us oppressed. So I'll just leave it, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. You are so absolutely right. Anti-racism work is really hard and EDI uh, and, and nice statements um, I, I don't, again, 
aren't going to do it. They're just not going to do it. And you're right about the discomfort and we need to embrace that discomfort uh, and be willing to, to pull up our sleeves and have those tough conversations if we're ever going to get anywhere. Um, Rowan, uh, what, what concluding thoughts do you have? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree that white supremacy is such an important theme to end on. And I agree with everything that Jasmine and Danya added to the conversation. Um, I, I think in terms of the fight against anti-Semitism and the IHRA and white supremacy today, it's really makes things blatant when you think about the fact that Donald Trump was the one who signed the executive order adopting the IHRA in the United States. And so the, the failure of that definition to really um, challenge far right anti-Semites like Donald Trump is, is evident in that fact. And of course, he, it wasn't like he then signed the law and it was used against him, he, he was fine. Um, and I think that that really emphasizes a larger issue with the IHRA approach that runs so counter to the work that we want to do, which is it's very much a top-down government approach. There's this kind of idea that if we want to fight anti-Semitism and it could be extended to Islamophobia, et cetera, you know, we just have to convince the government to put in this little policy and adopt this little definition. And, you know, those are the most important things we need to do. And of course, it, it runs so much counter to what Jasmine and Danya have already been saying. It also runs counter to, if we take a kind of historical standpoint on the relationship between governments and anti-Semitism, if anything, it's been the opposite. Um, and so I think it's, it's really crucial that when we're doing the serious work of fighting racism and creating uh, solidarity bonds and ties between our communities that we really emphasize, you know, obviously some lobbying, some talking with government officials and informing them is important, but the emphasis needs to be on building those community ties. And the emphasis needs to be on that kind of hard work that Dania was describing. Um, and I, I think one other powerful tool that we've been really trying to emphasize with the report that Cheryl and I have written is um, kind of in that vein of making sure of um, putting uncomfortable things forward is having people tell their stories, even when they're difficult stories of the kind of racism and exclusion that they faced. And so we try to capture, you know, the very kind of visceral, the very real impacts and, and standards or, um, and uh, attacks that people face for um, engaging in Palestine solidarity for so much as critiquing the IHRA definition and these things. And I think that it's really important to kind of put these voices forward, not in a necessarily, you know, diversity um, and inclusion kind of way of, look, we're putting everyone's stories forward, but really putting forward the kind of difficult aspects of what it means to be Jewish in Canada, Palestinian in Canada, Muslim in Canada, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that that's kind of important work in bringing these conversations together is um, to have people engage with each other's stories. And, you know, as Jasmine said, there's a, a lot of similarities between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and starting with those similarities and, and of course, taking into account the differences is, is crucial. And I think that looking at those kind of direct experiences is a really powerful way of doing that beyond just... Um, the more academic side, but really to engage with people where they're at on the grassroots level. Thank you so very much. Um, I think that wraps up our conversation. I would just like to thank each and every one of you, uh, uh, Jasmine, Danya, and Rowan, uh, for the hard work that you're doing. Thank you, IJV, uh, for the hard work that, that all of you are doing and for having convened this really important discussion. Like all great discussions, it uh, raised more questions than perhaps we answered, but I think that that's, that's the role, is not to have the answers, but to, to point to the questions that need answering and the work that still needs to be done and the work, work that still needs to be uh, unpacked. So I'm going to um, pass it back over to Corey with my sincere thanks to all of you who listened and everybody who's, who's thinking hard about these questions. Thank you so much. Great, just a quick word to wrap up. Thank you so much to all of you, Rima, Danya, Jasmine and Rowan. Um, and thanks to all the participants for joining. We had about a hundred people joining, I think, uh, through the evening, so that's great. Um, note that um, this the video of this 
uh, event will be available on Facebook, where it already is, and also will be available on YouTube once we get it up in the coming days. So feel free to um, to share it. And you know, it's important that we get this analysis really out there, and you know, get people thinking of some of these issues. Uh, so again, thanks so much. Um, I just threw a, a link to to donate in the chat. Of course, we always appreciate appreciate that that's that's really what we depend on to to do this work and bring events like this so please do uh, um, donate if you if you do have the means and can and of course um, support other you know ACLA's work and other other organizations doing this this crucial work so again thank you so much I guess we'll leave it at that and uh, we'll wish you all a very good night <laughs>